It affects all of us and we will all have to live with the consequences of the most contentious piece of legislation of the entire Cameron government. Tonight, the plan to reform the National Health Service. The legislation is far bigger than the law which created an institution all parties profess to love and protect. But does the system have to stay the same forever and ever? The health secretary tells us there's nothing wrong with the reforms, it's all about perceptions. I mean, you could say, oh, blame me as a communicator, but if people are literally distorting and misrepresenting what the bill does, I just literally have to fight back against that. These people have to make the health service work. They'll be putting their anxieties and hopes directly to the health minister, who thinks the whole reform is solely about making the system work better for patients. And one sun rises as another departs. James Murdoch quits News International. How long before News Corp gets out of British newspapers for good? Another day, another pile of argument about the government's attempts to reform the healthcare system. Labour claimed tonight that the government was trying to rush its now very knocked about bill through Parliament by the time of the budget next month. Rubbish, said the government. The plan, described by a senior NHS boss as so big you can see it from space, has had a very chequered history. Promoted by the Liberal Democrats and then amended by them. Introduced into Parliament in January last year, then suspended for a while, now approaching final votes. It is not what the government had hoped for. Our political editor, Allegra Stratton, reports. Away from Whitehall and Westminster to Worthing, a beach on the south coast. The government's health reforms look set to make it onto dry land. But what exactly do they change? How and when? What we have here is a charity that is part of, in effect, the NHS. We asked the health secretary to take us to somewhere that exemplified the reforms they're trying to get going, and he's brought us to Action for Deafness no, here in Sussex. If you're in the room, you have it at your level, it's yeah. an amplified level for her. This charity is being billed as the best provider of help for those hard of hearing, but it isn't strictly the NHS. Instead, as things stand, it's asked by the health service to cater for patient needs. Lansley's bill is supposed to give greater agency to GPs through new GP commissioning groups to give suppliers like this, if they're the best for their patients, the work. 60 seconds, 50 seconds, whatever, Josie clearly isn't fully aware of what's That's going right. on. Explain it. Right. What we're setting out to do, it basically comes down to, firstly, making sure that you as a patient, everything that happens to you, you should get really good information, and wherever possible, you should have some choice about the service that's provided to you, including where it's provided from. Secondly, you're registered with a GP surgery. Your GP's locally, and the doctors and nurses in, yeah. you know, around here in Worthing, yeah. they should be in a position where they are able to design the services that you need locally and use the NHS resources to make sure those yeah. services are here for you. Just days ago, Nick Clegg urged his party to take pride in the fact they had saved the NHS from privatisation. I think it strikes a bit of fear mm. in privatisation. Yeah, mm. because just explain to me why, what is it, because from my point of view, I, I, we're not going to do privatisation, but just explain to me what it is you think privatisation means as a problem. It will just go out to various people. Are those people going to care, like the National Health cares now? I mean, I've had a lot of dealings with the National Health regarding my father. My father died a couple of years ago, but to try and bring all those bits and pieces together was one long fight. But we got there in the end because we all worked together. But if it's going to be put out to privatisation, is it right. all going to work? So the sort is of thing, so the sort of thing I've been saying is, look, actually, it is going to be, it's going to be NHS care. Like this is NHS. Yes. It doesn't have a big sign no. saying, but this is actually NHS care. I know by the now political peril of this bill is clear. 
While the health secretary is down south, at Prime Minister's questions, Labour's leader goes on the attack for yet another week. But let me refresh his memory as to who opposes his bill. There's no good, by the way, the Deputy Prime Minister smirking. I mean, I don't know whether he supports the bill or opposes it. Uh, which day of the week? You support it? Oh, he supports it. Oh, he supports it, Mr Speaker. What you're saying is the critics don't really understand the bill. I have to say, there are a lot of things that I have seen said about the bill that appear to suggest they haven't even bothered to read it. That includes coalition partners, really, doesn't it? No. My, it my, does. My coalition partner. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Shirley Williams, actually, that's the point. You know, it ha we've spent, you know, some considerable time working with Shirley and others in the Lords mm -hmm. to get to a point where, yes, we are going to make some amendments, but they are amendments that give us, and them, a, a sense of actually finally putting precise reassurance in. And Health Minister Anarin Bevan cuts the first turf of the new £187,000 Woodbury Down Health Centre. Lansley's predecessors include the gargantuan founding fathers of the NHS. Is it up there with beverage, these reforms? <laughs> I wouldn't presume to such a thing. Actually, I think... If they're going to last for a long time, they've got to be. But the character of it, it is, it is, the character is very different from... If you go back to 1950, I mean, Anira and Bevin said, look, there's this tension between a centralised funding system and decentralised administration. And actually, over the, over the years, the fact that the centre has provided all the money has meant the centre has, has had all the control. Andrew Lansley was so trusted by the Prime Minister that years out of forming government, he was the only one of David Cameron's team to be promised he'd make the grade and go from shadow health secretary to the government job. The idea was no major reform, change, reorganisation, just steady as she goes. The public was to trust the Conservatives on the NHS. But now, because of these reforms, it's almost certain the NHS will be a battleground at the next election. And that was never part of their plan. It's one thing to get a bill through Parliament against opposition. Many have done it. But verdicts on policy come later, in the real world of people's experience. The challenge for this government is while they may will it to work, it's probably very soon out of their hands. Well, as you heard there, the Health Secretary was at a centre for the hard of hearing in Worthing earlier today. By happy chance, it's also the town where Oscar Wilde wrote the importance of being earnest. So a good place to uh, catch the embattled Health Secretary in the Spartan room his minions chose for an interview. Andrew Lansley, did you anticipate the sort of trouble you run into on this bill? Oh yes, I always knew that there would be, you know, there's always noise, the NHS matters, so people make a lot of passionate remarks about it. And uh, I mean, you could go back, um, 2003, do you remember, it's only less, less than a decade ago, Alan Milburn put forward foundation trusts in legislation. He had 136 of his own members of Parliament rebelled against him. The BMA said it would be the end of the NHS. The Royal College of Nursing came out against it. That stuff happens. But the point the person, is... You're the person who said in 2006 you were going to build consensus on the need for change. Yes, and we have you on failed. the need for change. No, on the need for change, absolutely we have. And in fact, on the principles of the bill. Because if you look at it, not only amongst organisations, but last year when the Future Forum went to thousands of NHS staff in hundreds of meetings across the country. They established that there was a consensus on the principles. Would this bill have been any different if you had not been in coalition? If it had just been a Conservative government, we would have started out in a different place. The, the bill is better as a result of the coalition coming together to shape it. And actually, I think the central point from the Liberal Democrats' point of view has been democratic, local democratic accountability. Local government in the new health and well-being boards bringing together health, social care, public health into a combined forum where local voices and local views can be added to professional views from the health service. Actually it's stronger as a consequence of being a coalition bill. But you know if you can't take cabinet colleagues with you on a profoundly important piece of it. But we have taken cabinet colleagues with us. No, at you each haven't. Stage they have. sign off on one thing and then they try to amend it. No, I, I'm sorry that's we, as a government, as a coalition government together, designed the legislation. We, as a coalition government together, Nick Clegg, David Cameron and I, we said, uh, you know, we want to improve the bill, we want to respond to people's concerns. We did that last year. 
and, we, and I think we did that very successfully. Are you also going to maintain that this rigmarole we've been through, with the legislation being introduced, it being paused while there are consultations, then amendments are introduced, many of which you accept, that was also anticipated, was it? No, no, actually because I thought that when we published the white paper, which we did in 2010, and we had 6,000 consultation responses, that actually most of the concerns would be there. It turned out that didn't, it didn't happen that way. That it wasn't until actually the bill was in uh, the Commons that many people said, look, well, we're worried about this, we're worried about that. So actually it was important to pause the bill, to listen and to respond, and we did that. And I think actually what that demonstrated was the support of, in principle for the bill across the service, and it gave us a lot of recommendations and we were able to accept them, which is why actually, I think, across the NHS, there is an understanding amongst many staff that this is actually, in a, a sense, the bill they helped shape. Doesn't it also demonstrate that however well you may be on top of your brief, you are a hopeless communicator? No, I don't think that at all, because a lot of the... You didn't take people no, with you? No, no. But then that didn't happen to any Secretary of State on health legislation at any time in the past. I mean, Patricia Hewitt stood up in front of the Royal College of Nursing and they booed and heckled her. Ken Clark, who's a fabulous communicator and far better than I am, he tried reform in the early 1990s and the BMA said it's the end of the NHS as we know it. And they, Do you remember they put great big billboard posters up with a picture of Ken Clark saying, you know, what do you call a man who doesn't take medical advice? Well, look, frankly... There is no way of undertaking major reform, important reform, if you, if, and imagining that you're going not to be misrepresented, not going to be distorted, not going to be the subject of argument, not going to be the subject of genuine concerns and genuine issues that you have genuinely to respond to. But I think we have pretty much reached the stage where quite a lot of the disinformation out there is a problem too because people are saying things that are literally not true. But the list of organisations, organisations that ought to know about the NHS as well as you know about the NHS, the Faculty of Public Health, the Royal College of GPs, the BMA, nurses, midwives and all the rest of them, are you saying they're And just... the Family Doctor Association and the Foundation Trust Network that represents Foundation Trust Hospitals, the Royal ignorant. College of Surgeons. Are you saying they're no, ignorant? No, I'm not saying they're ignorant. What, are they what I'm for saying propaganda? is... Well, they're engaged in various campaigns for various purposes. But what is really interesting is when you actually get to it, take the Royal College of Nursing, for example. I mean, when, when do you think they uh, oppose the bill? I don't know. You tell right. me. Uh, January. Um, up until that point, they had been literally with us. They said they supported the bill. So what? They, so they, they, they what fell, changed? They, they fell victim to some piece of propaganda or something? Well, what changed? You Maybe tell me. they... Maybe they read the bill. I have had conversations with them. I've tried to find out what changed that caused them What's to change theory? their minds. Well, my theory is because actually they were angry with the government because there was a continuation of pay restraint and, uh, and the pensions issue. So these and organizations. Frankly, I find it. Ex I find these it's, organizations are really can it, against the bill. But They're, Jeremy, explain to me how, how can it be true that we introduced the legislation in January 2011 and for a year the Royal College of Nursing worked with us? They say they support the bill. They literally, the says on more than one occasion, we support the bill. We make the amendments that they looked for in the course of the discussions that we had with them last year. And then suddenly they say they're against it. Well, because actually other things were going on. Can you guarantee finally that if this bill goes through and it's now much improved form, as you claim, that it will be the last reform of the NHS that you can foresee for the next 10 years? Yeah, I think, it, and I think we've, it, is a, it is a major piece of legislation. And why? Because we're dealing with many of the issues that haven't been dealt with in the past. And the reason why we need the legislation is to effect a transfer of responsibility and power to local authorities and to sure. local health organisations. it doesn't deal with a fundamental problem, which is that the NHS can no longer, or for not much longer, be afforded. No, it does. It does very much help with that. Because what it does is it puts the decision-making responsibility increasingly in the hands of people who can use resources better. Rationing is inconceivable, in your view. Well, priority setting is necessary and should be done by the doctors and nurses who are responsible for the care of patients. That is From my point of view, well, it's priorities, it, you know, local, it's not rationing because it's not depriving, no, because rationing tends to be depriving people of access to services. Which is Getting the people the right care at the right time in the right place is what it's about. Andrew Leslie, thank you. Thank you.
Well, with us now is the Shadow Health Secretary, Andy Burnham. Apart from taking 20 billion out, what is your policy on the NHS? We had a successful NHS when this government came in, a self-confident NHS judged by the Commonwealth Fund to be one of, if not the best healthcare system in the world. And what they've done in 18, 20 months in power is take that self-confident yeah. NHS, destabilise it, demoralise it, and turn it into an organisation fearful of the future. Well, we'll be the judge of what they've actually done to it. I was asking you what your policy is. My policy is a planned national health care system that we've had for 63 years so that you, delivers good quality so care. You haven't got to a the, policy apart from what already exists? I have a policy. I've just explained it. It's a national health service that is planned and provides, and provides care to a whole population, so, not a legislation for a market in health care that basically breaks all of that so apart. So no change? No, and actually, one of the arguments I would make, Jeremy, is that one of the problems with this bill is it's a distraction from the real reform the NHS needs. The NHS needs service reform, not back office structural reform. So you do it want needs, to change it? It needs to provide more care in the patient's home, in the community. Changes to the way we provide services on the but, ground. And this whole debate about the structures of the NHS is a massive distraction from that change to services that we need to see on the ground. In policy terms, what are you advocating? I've just explained. We need no, to see service you, you, change. You've asserted so, that people need more care no, in their in, homes, In for the example. century of the ageing society, we need to bring together health and social care. It was an argument I made as, How health, would you do that? as health secretary. I said we needed to reform the social care system yeah. so that we were providing more prevention in pe people's homes, better integration with the health service. This bill is a recipe for fragmentation and a move away from the integrated care that we need to see. No, I'm just interested in what, in what you want to do. I mean, is it just coincidence that when you're in government, Tony Blair boasts about the scars on his back that come, he said, from taking on vested interests in the public sector, and that when you're in opposition, you basically dance to the vested interest tune? I don't accept that at all. And in Was fact, drop the bill is the best piece of advice that an opposition has ever given uh, to a British Prime Minister and government. It's not opportunism, because what they did was make a catastrophic mistake by combining the biggest ever financial challenge in the NHS with the biggest ever top-down reorganisation. And they would do well now, at this late stage, to give the NHS the stability it needs so that it can face the financial challenge. And that's what I will be doing now. I will be giving the NHS the ability to focus on changing services, make them more sustainable so that they can is, then face the Is there likely to be any, any, any precision in, in what you tell us you're going to offer, should you ever be re-elected? I was part of a government that took the NHS from a position on its knees in 1997 and turned it into one of the best, if not the best, healthcare system in the world. So I think we can say, so, with the lowest ever waiting list... changing? Yeah, but it needs service change, and I've always argued for that. And we made some difficult change to services when we were in government. We made changes to stroke services in London. We made changes to the maternity services in Greater Manchester. These are the difficult changes the NHS needs. And actually, that's the, the nettle that all politicians have to grasp. If we're in this position where we're always using the NHS as a political football on hospital changes, then it will never get anywhere. That is what the NHS should be focusing on. This bill is a massive distraction from it. Okay, Andy Burnham, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, uh, with us now is the uh, Minister of State for Health, uh, Simon Burns, and an ensemble of uh, healthcare professionals. Between them, they represent thousands of nurses and doctors and treat patients across England and listen to those who've been patients of the NHS. Some agree with government reforms, others are sceptical. OK, let's start with this accusation about the uh, Royal College of Nursing. Did you sit in Andrew Lansley's office and tell him you believed in the bill? Sat in Andrew Lansley's office many times, telling him we had severe anxieties and concerns about this bill, but we were committed to try to work with it, and we worked with it for a year, and we didn't get anywhere, and we made the decision that we would now withdraw our support, because whilst there was a lot of listening, there wasn't much action. So you did tell him you supported the bill in one sense, but when it came to it, you decided you we, couldn't. We thought it was the responsible thing to do with the elected government of the day to try to work with this to see if we could change it, and we didn't succeed. This is which a is why very, we very it. significant uh, difference of emphasis. What's your recollection? Well, I was at some of the meetings, but not all of them, and certainly my recollection is similar to Andrew Lansley's. And we did listen. We have made changes that responded to what the Royal College of Nursing 
was asking for. For example, they wanted a nurse on all the, um, the clinical commissioning group boards. Um, following the um, Future Forum review, we have accepted that, and that is now happening. Is your recollection about the behaviour of the British Medical Association in any sense similar? Well, with all reforms, there will be people who are for it within an organisation, people who aren't. And what we found with the responses to the consultation document was the BMA were supportive of some things, but to be fair, they were less happy with others. When the Future Forum reported its recommendations, which we accepted last June, they warmly welcomed that because we were taking on boards um, ideas to improve and strengthen the bill. So, uh, Dr. Hamish Meldrum, um, did you also initially support the bill? <coughs> no. And, no, you um, never supported it? Never supported the bill. When the white paper came out, the headlines, which are about better clinical involvement, better patient engagement, quality, I mean, that's motherhood and apple pie. Of course you support that, but when you read the, what was beneath the headlines, no, we didn't support it. We engaged in the consultation process, and in fact, three months after the bill came out, we had a special representative meeting, meeting asking for the bill to be withdrawn. Oh, so, to say we've supported the bill, I'm sorry, is a travesty of the but truth. But you also opposed the setting up of the NHS. No, we didn't. Point. That's another mm -hmm. long and oft-repeated myth. The doctors, actually, the BMA proposed didn't, something. The, did actually, not, don't lose your surprise, Jeremy. Did he not say, I'll get their agreement by stuffing their mouths with gold? That was about the contractual arrangements within the NHS. It exactly. wasn't about, well, it wasn't about the NHS itself. The fact was that doctors did not want you, to be state employees and actually... You just don't not like change. That's your problem, that's isn't it? That's not true at all. I've been a GP for over 30 years. I've seen massive change, but it's been evolutionary change, not structure. I mean, the trouble is I've seen nine structural reorganisations that have actually made the NHS worse in many respects because of the reasons. They've been a huge distraction, they've been very costly, and they've taken the, the eye off the real change. Do you think the, the, the spokesmen for the vested interests in the National Health Service are really adaptable? Well, I would hope that they have the best interests of improving the NHS. Can I just pick up on one point? I was asking about your experience rather than your hopes. My experience of them. Yeah. I have found at times they have been prepared to discuss and to engage. I'm just disappointed that they have come to conclusions that I don't think are in the interest of moving the NHS forward. And what I find particularly disappointing about the BMA is they have come out against the bill, but at the same time at that special meeting, they voted for one of the core ingredients of the bill, which was clinical commissioning groups. OK. Now, Dr Alessi, you actually support this bill. You are a GP, aren't you? Yes, I am a GP. So you're seeing it from an entirely different hymn sheet than the BMA. Well, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at this on, on the basis of my consultation with my patients. And um, I, I can think of the way things will change in the future. Things won't happen very quickly. Change is not going to happen very rapidly. But we are going to get to a situation soon where we're going to manage the interfaces between the bits of healthcare <coughs> better. And we're also going to have more control over what happens to our patients than we have at the moment. And that's what so you all think this it is actually about. gives you freedom. I think it's, the change has been palpable. The discussions I'm having now mm. with my colleagues in hospital is completely different to what it used to be before. They have been liberated as well. They're able to speak to me. Before they were, they just, they just. The it doctors, just trades work. unions, well, angry. No, no, I'm saying the fact that that's happening even before the bill's passed shows that you didn't need a bill to allow that to happen. Mm. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, you know, we, you can't say this is all due to the bill. The bill is not even in law yet. Yet these things are happening, were happening. And the fact that doctors want to do the best for their patients, mm. as Sam Everington, who sat on a platform with Andrew Lansley just over a year ago and was... Uh, but as he said yesterday, just because we want to do the best for our patients doesn't mean we support this bill, and we don't. Marilyn Punt, you are a GP. Um, you also think there's a lot to be said for these reforms. Yes, I do. I think that uh, while I have some mixed views about the bill, I think there are some parts that I'm not supportive of. Actually, there's no doubt at all in my mind that as a GP involved in commissioning, it has made a huge difference to the influence that I've been but able to exert. if the changes have already been implemented, why do you need another piece of legislation? 
I've been trying to change things for the better for about 15 years and up until this legislation which attracted everybody's attention, I have not been able to get the traction that I needed to effect change. <coughs> But you have got the traction because you are making the changes, as Dr. Alessi has just told Absolutely, you. and it's because this bill and its, its scope, its scale and its sheer audacity has really hit the radar of absolutely everybody and people have started to behave, I agree, as if it's in legislation, but before this happened, under the previous administration, it was not possible. Change of administration is another matter, of course. But does, the clear implication of this is that we didn't actually need to do much of this. Yes, we do, actually. And that is a false myth put around, sadly, mostly by politicians. The reason we have to have the legislation is because they are moving in pathfinder form at the moment. But there is nothing in law to actually make the clinical commissioning groups accountable, so you need legislation, and also you have got to abolish the PCTs and the SHAs, and you cannot do that without primary legislation. Um, and that is why it needs the um, legislation to actually make it work. And so, Courtney, you speak for a number of patients' organisations. Can this bill, and I take it you've, you've read it, mm -hmm. right, On your, in your considered judgement, can it deliver better patient care? Well... National Voices members, and there are about 160 organisations re representing patients and carers, um, are on the whole very unhappy about the bill. They, they've uh, done a lot of lobbying and are very pleased that the government has listened in some cases and the bill includes more power for patients, more involvement in decisions about their care and so on. But the, it's a real distraction from the major issue which it faces our health system and everybody else's, which is people with long-term conditions who want joined up care. And the problem is that this bill seems to represent, or certainly the, the concern of our members is, that it's going to make care more disjointed, not more joined up. So it's not just a distraction. It's a positive impediment. Well, nobody really knows because the bill's incredibly complex, but it's there's a our... real fear that, yes, it's going to make you, things you worse. Feel it's one of our major concerns, this emphasis on competition, and what we should be doing is getting the component parts to work to each other, to collaborate with each other. It's, you know, the, the hackney joined-up yes, thinking. It, 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 this bill will stop that from happening. That is, I'm afraid, just factually incorrect. The whole ethos of the bill is putting patients at the centre of care and it's built having around the a, idea of competition. That competition has always been in the NHS and will continue to. And competition, when it is based on quality, can be a force for the good. Let just, me give you a brief example. Yes, please do. I will. You have two NHS hospitals within five miles of each other. One of them has a reputation through its surgeons for, the, um, for hip replacements. They have short waiting times for it. There may be other peripheral things, like their MRSA level are very low, their mixed sex um, ward accommodation is very low. And the hospital five miles away, an NHS one, has a poor record um, clinically on hip replacements. They have longer waiting times. With patients empowered with choice, you will see, probably, many more patients going to the hospital that is performing better. And that will be a spur for the less performing one to ask that's, why, that's to and then they now. will have the pressure the to that. raise up their standards to meet those of the hospital five miles away. Sorry, that is you a good thing. You can already do this. You already yeah. can do that. And, and if you can find the information about uh, the quality of the hospitals, you can choose to go to the best. The we didn't need a bill for that. Available yet, and that's Stephen Bubba, you doing. have some experience of how competition works, haven't you? Well, yes, I, I, and I, I'm finding some of the debate, you know, are we for or are we against the bill, slightly frustrating. And, and, and those of us in the... Well, those of us in the... Some of the real problems facing the service are ageing population, a majority of people in hospital beds mm. over 65, uh, long-term <laughs> conditions taking 70% of the health budget, and there are charities and social enterprises who want to do more to provide those services, and we want competition to enable that to happen. You presumably, I mean, you speak, you're heavily involved in charities that would like to do more. 
Well, I run a social enterprise. Well, yeah, exactly. Turnipot, yeah. You should be. I mean, you presume you welcome this, don't you? Well, it, it's not a case of, of welcome or not welcome. We, we, we are where we are. The, the fact of the matter is the competition issue is largely irrelevant. I mean, we've had competition in the NHS for some time. The question is, is management of the markets. And what really worries me is that um, not-for-profit organisations, social enterprises, um, aren't in a place where they can compete with some of the highly capitalised uh, private sector organisations. And I, just to give you an example, um, if you look at the provision of community health services in Surrey, um, that contract, which was worth £90 million a year, went to a private sector organisation um, when actually the best performer in terms of delivering community health care services was a social enterprise. But it simply could not compete. And I raised this, this matter with, with the Prime Minister because you can't just talk about competition um, without, having, without saying something about how you manage the market. And just one other thing, it is the case that where you've got limited resources, and we do have limited resources, competition, yeah. unfettered competition, can waste those resources. So there are lots of issues about the market and how we manage the market. Your experience, Ali Parsa, of, of letting different kinds of disciplines get to work is actually rather different, isn't it? Absolutely. And I Could just explain what you do. <clears throat> well, we are, I guess, now Europe's largest partnership of doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals who think that we should be able to run hospitals exactly in the same way that GPs can run GP practices. They are a partnership of people who have come together and are contracted back to the government to deliver to them the services the government want. Why can we not do that in hospitals? And Jeremy, where we were given the opportunity to do it, for instance in Bath, from scratch, without any government grant or support, we built a building that won the award for the best building globally, public sector. We brought Mandarin or people who brought Mandarin Oriental, a luxury hotel, to design the services. We get a Michelin star chef to cook every single day for our patients at NHS prices to NHS patients. It That's almost what can makes be you done. want to be ill. Please, <laughs> when you're ill, Jeremy, you're very welcome. Well, but I mean, see, but what is it wrong? can I be done. I don't understand. Why do you oppose well, this? Well, for a start, you don't need a bill to do that, as Ali has just demonstrated. But, all, to, take, but to take Simon's point with the two hospitals, actually the hospital that's poor needs to be sorted out. Yeah, you, patients exactly. are still going to have to go there. You need to yeah, sort out uh, sort of... Uh, bad inequality of service, competition will not help that. And actually, I mean, this bill is costing about £3 billion. No, it's, it, it's taking a huge amount of people's minds off the actual well, care of patients. What do you mean the bill patients. is costing it? The implications of the bill, the implementation of the, the bill. implementation of the no. bill. Jeremy, can but, I uh, just tell us, put us yeah, right on Can there. we put this right? Because there is so Please, much. Yes, on. How much is it going to cost? The cost it? of it, as the impact assessment shows, is one2 to £1.3 billion pounds as a one-off cost, and as a result of that, between now and 2015, the savings will be £4.5 billion pounds to reinvest in the health service, and for the rest of the decade, £1.5 billion pounds per annum, all to be reinvested in the health service. Well, if, if the but government but would publish the risk register, we might that has actually have a do better assessment of Well, you're of changing that. your subject now. Well, yes. no, this is no, the risk of this legislation. You asked about money, he mm -hmm. told you about money, now you're talking about the risk register. Please. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you put clinicians in the driving seat of reorganising health care, we really do understand the product of health care in a way that professional managers don't always. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely certain that my colleagues and a lot of younger doctors are now coming forward and really engaging with the business of trying to improve services for patients. And the NHS is not perfect. There are areas where we can do better and we know where they are. We don't need a lot of data. We speak to patients on a daily basis and we really do understand what needs to be fixed. And I think we're, we are the best place people, clinicians working in partnership with nurses and with hospital colleagues Look, to fix these. I really must. Go on. We, we need to be remind ourselves this is the NHS and social care bill. It's not just about, actually, it's not just about clinicians deciding mm -hmm. what populations want. What it should be about is clinicians and populations deciding how they provide an integrated well, health and yeah. social care but, system. But Hang on, just, just, let me finish, just, just, which is about commissioning. And so far, just, it's just a point I'm making. I'm not yeah. saying that I disagree with any of you. I'm just making the point that we've talked about the NHS 
about, as though it's about hospitals and clini yeah. clinical interventions. It is the but, NHS and social but care bills. We're not going to about save 20 billion quid with the unless we well, integrate health and Shaw, who said that all That's professions are a conspiracy against the public. Surely it's the a... NHS is about patients. Yes, yes. That's, That's exactly. my point. And That's my point. It's the NHS and social care bill. It's also about in the centre of this, and they want they want to have an. Uh, yes. care that's well coordinated Absolutely. and meets their needs Absolutely. and the problem with this is that's that this this shake up of the NHS is putting organization against organization it's dividing professionals it's actually not helping it's going to take about four years before the commissioning groups really learn how to do it okay it'll take some time to settle in and in the meantime a lot of people are going to be ill and want better coordinated Jerry, care you look you look at countries who, according to OECD, have the best healthcare quality in the world. France, Germany, Switzerland. And they the are UK a cooperation. The they are a cooperation between the private sector, public okay. sector. Yeah. The private sector in Germany runs more hospitals, more healthcare provisions than the, than the public sector does. But it does it in a regulated market in which people can't cherry pick, in which people need to focus on the patients. And that's what we need to focus on. We shouldn't focus. British public is not concerned on whether the service is provided by public sector, private sector, government. It's concerned about whether it's fair, it's accessible, it's free at the point of delivery. And we should focus on making sure that happens. And when that happens, when that happens, everything will be fine. And by yeah, the way, for those, the who think, for those who think that the private sector or the social enterprises just take the cherries, let me say it here and now, please, well, we please, give us all your potatoes. Keep the cherries. <laughs> we love to have all the things you don't want. France and Germany so, spend about 2% more of their GDP on health care. The Commonwealth Fund said that the NHS, the British health care system, was the most cost-effective health care system but in the, the world. Best. But not the best. Well, the if, we spend, if we spend there is a, more, there is a it would be the best. Yeah. Okay, um, you haven't done much of a show. Can, so, we, can, we just have a, can we just have an opportunity, perhaps, now... We're in this state whereby we're starting to have a dialogue with our local authorities. This has Absolutely. started now. Let's just give us the oxygen we need to make this happen. We need, we need the space, we need the time to make this happen. But all this I wonder happened. if you feel, though, as a practicing GP, that in a sense this is rather missing the point. That we can have these organizational changes, but actually there is a real crisis in this country about how on earth we carry on paying for health care, yeah. given the... Well, unless we change what demand. we're doing, yes, yeah. we are going to get into yeah. difficulty, but I believe but, but only by having these dialogues at this level, at this intensity, can we actually manage to find a way out but, of but where we, we are at the moment. But we know can that, I, the, we know that the NHS needs to no. change. I, I, a Go lot on. of this debate... It, 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 is often dominated by a professional view, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the citizen view doesn't Absolutely. often get in. And just to give you an example of this, what we want is more choice in the health service. The NHS Constitution guarantees choice, but it doesn't deliver it. If at the end of your life you want to die at home or in a hospice, you are often denied that choice. The majority of people want to die at home or in a hospice. They die in a hospital bed. There are charities out there, Macmillan, Marie Curie hospices, that would love to provide that care. They're not commissioned, and the system needs to be opened up so that those organisations can be commissioned and provide that choice to people, and that's what people... That want. will happen under your bill, will it? Yes, it will. Yeah, in... okay. It's already happening. It's already it's, happening. It, it, no, it isn't. It isn't, because the majority of people at the right. end of their life, are dying in a hospital bed. Right. And they wish to die in a hospice or I'm, a home. I'm Let's gonna... support charities who can provide that, that for them. There is I'm, going to, have to, there I'm, is I'm really going to have to point, stop though, you, I'm afraid, because we've, got, saving the we've money got to get on to something else. All right, good. Thanks very much. <laughs>